Hi, it's me, Ingrid INFP, and uh, we're going to be talking about um, Fragments of Sappho, uh, which is a book that I got at the library. Um, Sappho was the original lesbian, so uh, let's take first the first quote, which is the one that most people know, which is, someone will remember us, I say, even in another time, uh, which turned out to be true. Turned out to be true when it comes to lesbians. And another one is this: uh, "Sweet mother, I cannot work the loom. I am broken with longing for a boy by slender Aphrodite." Or, in some in some versions, it's "Sweet mother, I cannot weave. I am broken with longing for." Um, uh, for a boy by Slender Aphrodite. So, I mean, she liked boys and girls. <laughs> um, and uh, I also like this quote, and on the eyes, black sleep of night mingled with all kinds of colors. Now let's go from the beginning. The red things that I have here are basically all of her lovers. So I have a lot of quotes about her lovers. Um, I uh, am going to just be going through some quotes that I like. Um, Deathless Aphrodite of the Spangled Mind. Child of Zeus, who twists lures. Um, and then she goes on to talk about well, Aphrodite, basically. And asked what? Now again, I have suffered. And why? Now again, I am calling out. And I, what I want to happen most of all in my crazy heart. Whom should I persuade, now again, to lead you back into her love? Who, O oh Sappho, is wronging you? So, and when she says now again, it's this repetition that, um, well, it reminds us of certain acts, okay? Uh, and it's talking about, uh, well, how the, um, the god Aphrodite doesn't care about mortal things, such as, well, sex. Um, well, that's precisely what Sappho wants, is the mortal sins. Um, then I like this quote of, um, and then this cold water makes a clear sound. Oh. Uh, the whole place is shadowed and down from radiant shaking leaves, sleep comes dropping. And that's exactly how sleep feels like, right? A lot of Sappho's poetry is very sensory, you know, like you can feel the honey in your mouth and all that. And here she talks about in this place, you, Cypris, taking up in gold cups delicately, nectar mil mingled with festivities, pour. Um, uh, some say an uh, army of horse, and some say army on foot, and some men say an army of ships is the most beautiful thing on the black earth. But I say it is what you love. And then she talks about somebody called Anactoria, who is gone, uh, who is some kind of lover. Pan to tell, tongues to tell tales, and for a man greater. Then she talks about uh, Gorgo, who is another person. <laughs> Uh, but she's not important. There are a lot of uh, companions who are both men and female. Innocent no longer Megara. Megara is one of these people. Uh, who else? Athos is one of those people. And so she's really into Athos. But she goes back and forth remembering gentle Athos and in longing she bites her tender mind. That is some pretty deep shit. Okay. And who else? Uh, you, Mika, 
but I will not follow you. You chose the love of the pentalids. Evil turning some sweet song in honey voice, piercing breezes, sweet with dew. And here we've got uh, Athis. To you it has become hateful to think of me, and you fly to Andromeda. Okay, here is some basically gay drama, right? Um, then she talks about the moon, obviously. Stars around the beautiful moon hide back their luminous form whenever all full she shines on the earth, silvery. So the, that's kind of like the first um, mention of the moon being silvery, apparently. In my dripping pain, the blamer may winds and terrors carrying him off. So that is uh, an, an allusion to pain being like a dripping feeling, which apparently Beckett uses later uh, on. Uh, and there is a kind of a note at the end here. Um, let, let me find it. Uh, this is in Beckett's Endgame. Um, there's something dripping in my head, a heart in my head. There's something dripping in my head. Splash, splash, always in the same spot. And I, I don't know why Anne Carson, who did the translation of this, uh, decided to correlate these two. And, but it is interesting how we conceptualize of different feelings, you know? Then there's a nice quote here. I on a soft pillow will lay down my limbs. That's exactly how it feels like to have a pillow. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Two states of mind in me. Relatable. Um, and this is a, a poem about a person who, a woman who is uh, dying and floating away into, um, well, nothingness, basically. Dead you will die, and never memory of you, there will be no desire into the aftertime, for you do not share in the roses of Pierre, but invisible too in Hades' house. You will go your way among dim shapes, having been breathed out. Like breathed out, like you're just like air. Then there's a short snippet here. It makes a way with the mouth. The beautiful gift children, song delighting, clear sounding lyre. Song delighting, clear sounding lyre. I mean, that's a thing, you know? Then there's just a page where it just says, sinful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I found that kind of funny. Um, that's, that's the kind of book that I'm reading, okay? Um, then she talks a lot about violets and she talks about for many crowns of violets and roses at my side you put on and many woven garlands made of flowers around your soft throat and she talks a lot about uh, death as desire and love as pain or a battle um, which is interesting you know I don't know if she invented that, or if other people did too, but uh, she was an inspiration for a lot of uh, poets later on. A kind of yearning has hold of me, to die. That's kind of how this desire, because she can take no pleasure. She, there's a lot of uh, themes that come later on in poetry, and it's interesting how so far in time is Sappho, uh, in the Greek times, ancient Greece. Uh, that she was already, um, we were already feeling those human emotions at that time. You gather a lamb, gather a kid, gather a child to its mother. Of all stars, the most beautiful. She does a lot of uh, poems about weddings. So it's a lot about like gathering the things for the procession, for the ceremony. Um, as a sweet apple reddens on the high branch, high on the highest branch, and the apple pickers forgot, no, not forgot, were unable to reach. And it's once again this desire for something that is unattainable. I am not someone who likes to wound, rather I have a quiet mind. Okay? That's nice. Then she talks about, uh, if this is the sensory stuff of Sappho, this gold sandaled dawn. Dawn has golden sandals. 
uh, which is which is perfect, you know. I really like that. Then she talks about there's this, there's um, the swallows and the nightingales. There is some kind of myth around it, which I'm not sure about, but I I will look it up. Far more sweet sounding than a lyre, golder than gold, which was like one of the first like. It's her use of hyperbole is very, <laughs> uh, you know, whiter than white, you know, these kinds of things are, you know, uh, it's, it's amazing how much, like, they use language uh, to, to get these ideas across that you can't get um, with the general prose, you know. Then I thought that this was funny because there are some fragments that are just like there, like soda, <laughs> okay. Many skilled celery, gold ankle bone cups. <laughs> uh, then it talks about how. Um, then the, we're in the notes section, and uh, there are some um, people who have been really interested in Sappho, who are just like at our poet, and. You know, uh, first there's um, there's this guy. What's his called? He's called um, Longinus. Longinus is very love Sappho for some reason. Are you not amazed at how she researches all at once the body, the soul, the body, the ears, the tongue, the eyes, the skin, all as if they have departed from her and belong to someone else? In contradictory. Rarely, in one instant she chills, she burns, is crazy and sensible, and, for she is in horror, terror and almost dead, so that no single passion is apparent within her but a confluence of passions. And her selection, as I said, is the most important element, and her combination of these in a, to a whole achieves excellence. So we, we admire a Stan, <laughs> okay? He's a, a real um, Sappho Stan. And we've got um, the fact that lesbians, well, the people of Lesbos, the women of Lesbos, uh, venerated Hera, who is the goddess of marriage, uh, is, is kind of weird, you know, to think about, you know, because so many were into the cult of Sappho um, as well, who was a real person, Hera was a goddess. Um, but yeah, so I, I just find that funny, you know. That these are people who are <laughs> examining gender in a very different way and in the way that we are. Um, and the final uh, thing is that Emily Dickinson um, talks about the fecundity of daylight um, and mo moonlight and um, so Emily Dickinson took inspiration from Sappho which I find is very, uh, very apt. I really love Emily Dickinson. And uh, I really love Sappho. So uh, yeah, that was my um, <laughs> a review of this book. Really good, you know, Anne Carson did a great job translating these to make it sound very good in English. Because otherwise it feels like really just fragments, you know, of ancient Greek, uh, which, you know, is not <laughs> intelligible. Let me show you uh, the cherry blossoms. So the, this is my view, uh, basically, as I was uh, reading Sappho, which is amazing. Um, and uh, yeah, let me... Re uh, so I hope that you guys have a great day, um, and uh, uh, I hope that there is sun wherever you are. Have a great day, bye.